obviously very topical yesterday was uh, SNP's one notch downgrade of Spain and what the broader repercussions for the Eurozone will be. And within that context is the fact that the IMF bailout for Greece seems to be closer at hand. Yeah, uh, a bailout, not the bailout, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you'd rather say, because it, it happens that uh, if you look at the progression, it came from like 45 billion, and now they're talking 145 billion plus, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So the situation uh, seems to be the, they're throwing money at, at the situation. They don't have a full long-term plan as to what's mm -hmm. going to happen in Greece. The Greeks themselves are very uh, reticent about having these austerity measures put on them. Yeah. Uh, they want to keep their, their pensions at 61 years, mm -hmm. uh, whereas, for instance, the guys that are bailing them out, the Germans, only retired 67. Mm. So you can see the, that kind of uh, discrepancy there. But uh, yes, there is some progress to some kind of you know, new bailout for Greece. OK, now let's talk about the Spain issue, because I think that's the one that needs some attention. What does this downgrade mean for this economy? Because we're already faced with a situation where in Spain, unemployment is somewhere in the region of 18% and rising. Um, we've got threats of asset bubbles in that economy, also because of what seemed to have been very lax lending processes by banks in order to try to stimulate the SME sector and also mortgages. Yeah, I think what happened was Spain, Portugal, Greece, they all basically were less developed countries. They weren't fully up to the same level of economic development as the rest of the Eurozone. And for instance, the Germans were quite developed as a country. So when the Spanish and the Greeks and the Portuguese joined the Eurozone, they suddenly had access to this incredibly cheap credit mm -hmm. because you know suddenly they're safer and therefore they have less risk and therefore less uh, interest rates mm -hmm. are required of them. And they didn't use it to actually build productive activity. They didn't build factories with that. They built houses. Yeah. And that's how they built their economy on, on a massive construction sector, which obviously is, is not something you can sustain an economy mm -hmm. on. And you're right, the, port the Spanish have a much, much higher um, unemployment rate than the rest of Europe. 20% uh, for the general population and in much higher levels for the, uh, you know, the under 30s, the younger people mm -hmm. in the country. But the difference between Spain and Greece is that at least Spain probably can pay its debts out. There's, there's, a, there's a, f a foreseeable like path into which Spain can actually pay off its debt. The Greeks, not so much. Okay, Spain is a much larger economy also than Greece, four times larger yeah. than Greece. If there are any concerns about Spain, I mean, the direct impact on the Eurozone will be more heartfelt than the threats of debt defaults in a country such as Greece. So in terms of interim measures to try to buffer Spain from any kind of tumbling, what should be done? Oh, yes, I mean, this is a, a case of the dominoes falling and each domino is bigger. It's uh, Greece and it's Portugal is bigger than Greece, then Spain bigger than Portugal, and possibly Italy, which is bigger than Spain. Uh, I think if they can manage to basically calm the Greek situation, what happens is then Spanish and Portuguese borrowing becomes cheaper. And there's no way in which you can actually cut your spending but still have to pay high interest rates and still be able to get out of a debt mm -hmm. situation. If you keep interest rates at least stable, right. cutting spending will work. But if interest rates rise, as uncertainty rises, if Greek falls, then mm -hmm. your spending cuts mean nothing. OK, let's stay within uh, Europe, but outside of the Eurozone. Obviously, UK elections in the next month and a series of uh, party debates have been taking place. The economy debate took place last night, and apparently David Cameron, according to uh, poll samples, seems to be leading that yeah. Uh, conversation. Yeah, it, it's kind of strange. Uh, uh, Gordon Brown may turn out to be third, but he may still remain prime minister. It's quite strange how that works. Because what's happened is that the UK have actually added on their third party. Uh, they've, they have had other parties, or well, the third party's been around for a, a while, mm -hmm. uh, the Liberal Democrats, but for the first time it's actually become a major player and it's actually beating Gordon Brown in mm -hmm. the election at the moment. Mm -hmm. But there's a chance that they might have a coalition government between Gordon Brown and then the uh, Liberal Democrats because they're closer in terms of mm -hmm. you know sh um, policies, etc. I mean, they're both on the left. Uh, the Conservatives on the right. So you have two leftish parties and one rightish party. And even though the two left parties may be smaller than, mm -hmm. than individually the right party. All right, let's talk about what they offer the British public because we know, um, as a major player within Europe, Britain's the first economy to fall into the recession, the last to get out of the recession. Trying to get factory figures up and manufacturing stimulated has been a real challenge. Regulation of the City of London has been a real political hot potato. And, um, you know, just trying to stimulate liquidity in that economy has been a challenge. Sterling has held up relatively well compared to what the euro has done in recent weeks and months. But um, are they out of the woods, the English uh, not, or not, the British? Not, not at all. I mean, they have a major, major problem in the UK as well. I mean, their, their debt situation is quite bad. Uh, they are out of the Eurozone, so they don't have to pay for the Greeks. But then again, they are out of the Eurozone, so the Germans aren't going to bail them out as well. <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the negative. Uh, and, and the situation is that the 
British built their economy, not like the Germans, which both are European countries, but the, G the British are much more reliant on financial services, whereas the Germans are much more reliant on manufacturing, and therefore the British obviously are more affected by the downturn. And if you look at some of the plans that they have in terms of you know, taxing the banks ahead of everyone else, having tariffs ahead of everyone else, they could easily drive the financial sector of the UK out to maybe mm. Switzerland or mm. maybe even Germany, who knows. Mm. But they depend so much on that sector, it's quite uh, disturbing to see what kind of plans they have in place for them. Okay, and just in terms of the election and what the various proponents are offering, the Tories, what are they offering in terms of financial services regulation, which has become, you know, as I'm saying, a, a very critical issue to being debated at multilateral levels such as the G20, the, the focal point or the epicenter of what's happened in financial services in Europe has been London. Oh yes, I mean, I mean it's, it's Europe and London, it's, it's New York and London are the two major financial centers of the world. And if you look at a lot of commodities out there, the primary market is London. Uh, the, the problem is that the plans that they have in place, for instance, the uh, unilateral raising of tariffs and restrictions on banks, if you do it as a part of a group, the banks can't flee anywhere. But if you're the only country that raises tariffs, the banks will go to somewhere right. else where the tariffs aren't as high. Right. I mean, there's no reason for them to stay in London. Uh, you can always take your, your, your smart brains across to Switzerland, mm -hmm. and it's not such a bad place to live in Switzerland. And that's the kind of danger that the UK is in under. Right. Okay, coming back um, home, we've seen the RAND trading in the 7.3 uh, to the dollar range, 9.7 to the euro range. The euro seems to be strengthening uh, after figures that it was trading at uh, earlier on in the week, and that's largely because a little bit more confidence comes out of the fact that a bailout seems imminent for Greece, and also you know, comments from the US Federal Reserve in the last few days on Wednesday in particular assuring markets that no matter what's happening the US recovery is steady it's on course um, they are looking at various easy money options and um, you know just stabilizing that system yeah I mean uh, if you think about it, what could the Fed actually say they can't say we are in trouble they would have to come up with the reassuring line but you're right I mean the 132 to the dollar level you know 132 to the dollar was a very important technical level and that level has held so far and uh, these kind of next moves that we have with the weekend, etc., where the Germans are going to be forced to come in and save the Greeks, uh, are probably going to boost up the Eurozone. Um, and therefore, going to help us as well, because what's happening is that the weakening of the Eurozone strengthens the dollar and strengthens the dollar against us, and therefore, mm -hmm. that's the kind of effect that we have. So, any kind of strength in the Eurozone is also going to help us out, because it also reduces uncertainty and also helps us, our currency, in that way as well.